All right. What is up, everybody? Welcome back to another day of SaberSims DFS Office Hours. It is Wednesday, December 22nd of 2021. Thanks for tuning into the stream today. Feeling a little stiff here today. I, I was up on the slope snowboarding on Saturday year and managed to, I think, mess my back up a little bit. So uh, feeling a little sore here today, but excited to, to hop on and, and talk a little bit of DFS with everybody. If this is your first time watching the show, as always, this is open Q&A. Pop your questions into YouTube chat. Pop them into the Office Hours channel if you're in our Slack community, and we will talk and answer questions for whatever you guys want to talk about here. We've got some good questions in the queue here today. We've got uh, the question from Six that I missed yesterday about uh, kind of controlling the roster construction that you're getting for your NFL showdown lineups. A uh, couple questions about adjusting exposures and knowing uh, how much is too much. That one's been popular lately, so excited to dive back into that. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about some contest selection and, and setting sliders. Um, and uh, let's see, one other question here about um, using Excel or how uh, maybe some custom Excel work can uh, can fit into your your DFS process. Six said, "Yo, check out Jordan getting a snowboard on." Yeah, I don't really know what happened. I like had a pretty normal day up there, um, but my back has like been killing me since. So uh, not great, not great at all. But um, see what happens. We'll I'm sure. Sure, it'll start feeling better here. But anyway, let's go ahead and get into it. We have what was a six-game slate has become a five-game slate for NBA up tonight. Hopefully stays at five games. We'll see what happens. I find that uh, the NBA contests get quite a bit harder when we drop below that five-game line. The four games and three games and even the two-game slates uh, can be pretty tough. But um, let's get into this here. Let's let's answer this question that you had, Six. So I'm going to go ahead and copy, the, copy this question here, and, and we'll read it aloud, and we'll get started. But uh, cool. So question says, when running simulations for two gamers or super small slates where there where a lot of overlap is to be expected, what would you suggest setting or changing in SaberSim to avoid creating lineups without two running backs from the same team? For example, I was getting a lot of David Montgomery and Damian Williams or even Khalil Herbert in some of the same lineups and just want to ask if there's a good way to avoid them without sifting through all of them individually. I know maybe... Uh, there are one or two teams or situations where two teams from the same team can get there in a GPP, but generally seems like a 95th or a 99th percentile outcome. So I'd like to ask SaberSim to not do that of, unless, of course, it absolutely screams, yes, I want to have two running backs in the same backfield, but just seems like something that can be adjusted using the sliders as opposed to setting a rule of some sort so that SaberSim can run freely. Uh, perhaps raising the correlation slider more than suggested or lowering the ownership slider uh, just spitballing but curious your thoughts or suggestions with upcoming two gamers or playoff slates that are in our future yeah good question here so uh this one's popular i i think i'll start with this so the unfortunate reality is that at the moment there's not really a good way to set a rule that can just remove this combination of players from your lineups uh either pre-build or post-build there are stacking rules that you can use in the two game slates but they work more for make sure i have this combination of players and less so for avoid this combination of players. Um, I have talked a little bit before about, let's get a build started because we're going to need one anyway for this question. Um, I have talked before about how you can, or one thing we want to add is in step three to use a filtering combination uh, and then basically make it so you can just immediately exclude all those player combinations from your particular lineups, right? At the moment, on a practical level, the only way to really do this uh, is to do it somewhat manually here and, for example, select for uh, both Jeff Wilson and Jamichael Hasty and X these lineups out. And then what I would recommend doing is go back through and uh, select for lineups that don't include both players when you put your lineups, when you put some lineups back in here. So let's see. Let me go ahead and do that. So maybe you're replacing with this lineup and this one, something like that. Right, and I know that's kind of manual. Um, I, I I know it's it's a little bit manual to do that, and then especially if you're talking about a main slate, maybe you're doing this for multiple teams. Uh, it can be a little tedious, so it is something we want to add. Um, I'm going to add a couple points about this first. So I do think it's an interesting idea. Why can't I, can I just raise the correlation slider uh, and um, make it so negatively correlated players are not showing up in the same lineups together? Uh, you can. Um, the reality is, though, is that these players are not always as negatively correlated as one might think, right? 
uh, especially with same team running backs, there is that that minor negative correlation, but these players have a lot of outcomes where they succeed together or fail together. Like, and you, the, the negative correlation is not as strong there. I think as people often think they are um, really even just like same team players. Like we could look at somebody like, let's look at Ayuk um, or Ayuk. I don't really know how to pronounce his name. Um, right. Like, even uh, another common thing is like these same team pass catchers, right? Only one team, only one player on the on the team can catch the touchdown on any given play, right? Like these these co- negative correlations are there, but they're they're pretty soft. These are not extreme negative correlations. And when you're building lineups for showdowns and small two three game slates, right? The sim variance slider is going to be ten. So when you get these players together in the lineup, I, and I know I say this all the time, so I, but I think it's an important concept to to grasp here. It is not by pure luck, or it is not just because they fit per salary based on their projection, et cetera, into the lineup. It is because in that individual single game sim that is represented by that lineup, those two players were optimal together, right? And even better, the rate at which you get lineups that into, include those two players together is roughly a, equal to the rate at which those two players are optimal in the entire set of sims, right? Like we could expand the pool here and look at the pool size of 500 and look at how often do we get a Wilson and um, hasty lineup together. Right. So of all of the lineups that feature Jeff, and I'm, I'm only doing the flex positions here, but of all the lineups where Jeff Wilson is optimal in the flex, right. There are 7% of the time Jermichael hasty is also optimal. Right. And that's, that is at least for this set of 500 Sims, the, approximate rate at which these two players are are optimal together so i i I think ultimately our goal is that you can go in here and build the exact lineups that you want right and or select for the exact lineups that you want and i know it is a little bit tedious if you say jordan i get it i know how this all works i understand the sims but i don't want to play these two guys together I, i just don't want to right we want to add more functionality to make that easier but at the same time i think it's important to make sure that you are not if, if you are approaching this conversation from these two players are very negatively correlated and cannot succeed together and be optimal together, I think you are thinking about it the wrong way because we can actually directly see how optimal they are together, how often they are to be optimal together. And they will show up in your lineups as that combination at approximately the same rate they are optimal in the individual simulations. If you're coming at it from a standpoint of, I think these two players are going to be paired together often, or I want to leverage the field because I think this is going to be a popular uh, construction or something like that, right? Like that's different. And I totally get that. Or I know Cody's here. Cody had one recently um, the other day where he was talking about how he was trying to build, or I actually, I think this was weeks ago now, but trying to build Viking stacks, right? And you have too many lineups that are, uh, Cousins and Thielen and want more Jefferson or the other way around or something like that, right? Like a diversification thing. I think that totally makes sense. And our goal here is to make this easier in the long term to have more control over. But just keep in mind that from the standpoint of creating lineups that are correlated, building optimals that actually represent particular game outcomes, that part is really taken care of for you. So um, anyway, short answer here, not an easy way to do this at the moment beyond using the filters to uncheck and check the lineups that are constructed the way that you want into your pool. We're planning on adding more functionality in the future to make that easier. Uh, but check on your assumptions for why you want to do these things. Um, some of the players that are negatively correlated together may not be as negatively correlated as you might think. And the rate at which negatively correlated players are combined in a lineup together is is equivalent to how often it's happening in The Sims, roughly. Um, and negative correlation is not really a bad thing, even on two game slates or showdowns, right? Like sometimes it can be a good thing if it differentiates you. So, um, but cool. Good question though. And let me know if you, let me know if you have any follow up there. Um, six said, sorry, I'm long winded. No, it's all good. It's good. I mean, it, sometimes it can really help, especially for me answering, uh, these kinds of questions here, um, to know the full, the full context of, of what you're trying to do. So. Um, Cody said, I suppose raising correlation could have that effect, but it would also cause other issues you might not want. I I think that 
is probably true. I'd be cautious of raising the correlation slider on showdowns. We talked about this a little bit yesterday, but I think it's it's going to push you in a direction that makes you more duplicated and actually could push you in a direction where you're moving away from lineups that are optimals for certain game simulations to lineups that are that are not. Um, or if they are optimals for other game simulations, they're much higher owned or much more likely to be duplicated. So, um, Sean said, where were you boarding? I was up at uh, Copper Mountain in in the in, in Colorado, Denver area. Right, that's where I'm. That's where I'm from. But um, all right, cool. Let's keep it going here. Um, I'm going to jump to uh, some of these other. Actually, I'll hit this one really quick because Sean. This is a quick question. Sean said, "Can somebody uh, remind me when selecting the number of entrants? Is it effective entrance or just total entrance? It's it's total lineups in the contest. I know entrance, especially with the way that we use entrance in our contest selection stuff, is a little confusing here. Uh, so this is total, like the total number of lineups in the contest. So." But Sean said, one of my favorites, I grew up in Denver. Yeah, Denver seems like a little bit of a DFS hotspot. I don't know, I don't know what it is. It's a cool city, though. But there's a lot of, a lot of DFS, con even like content creators out here. So, um, all right, cool. Let's jump to another question here. Uh, this one is from M. Jackson, came in in Slack earlier this morning here. And uh, well, what's going on here? Oh, now it's going to post twice. Okay. Uh, this says, um, is there such thing as adjusting exposures too much? I used to run the lineup straight with no adjustments, but lately I have been manipulating exposures heavily. I'm afraid I may be negating the magic of SaberSim as doing so. The results have been iffy. Yeah, I would say if this is something that you've just been experimenting with lately, uh, your sample size of judging the results of that change is probably way too small to come up with anything uh, really satisfactory or, or statistically significant. Um, I would, I would in general argue that you can pretty, I, I would say, especially if you're using default sliders, you're not making too many changes to projection or ownership, right? Not to say that there's anything wrong with making changes to projections or ownership, but it's definitely riskier, right? But if you're using relatively default settings for your contest, uh, there's there's not really a point that I would say you are going to adjust exposures too much beyond maybe exceeding the actual pool of lineups that we've built for you here, right? What, what's ultimately going to happen here, right, is we build the lineups. We're using some default settings. We're building a big pool of 500 lineups that we think are viable for the contest. And then via Saber score, which is our attempt at quantifying upside, we're going to pick our favorite 20, right? But there's all of these lineups we feel are viable for the contest, right? Even all, all of the ones in the pool because they're built at the, the proper settings. And you'll see, even from the standpoint of you, if you want to use projected score or Sabre score, right, you can get far, far down into this list and you're poking through here um, and really not sacrifice much of either of these. Um, I, I would say in general, you can feel pretty comfortable with taking some pretty significant stands in your exposures here, knowing that you're, you're pivoting to other lineups that are uh, optimal or that not, not so much optimal is not the right word, but that are viable for the contest. I mean, even fades of some of the, the chalkiest best value plays on the entire slate uh, are generally pretty easy to pull in a entirely different pool of 20 lineups that don't include DeMarcus Cousins, for example. So what you will see in general is, especially if you're running builds for 20 maxes or even 150 maxes, right? Is that uh, your exposures to players, right? in your final pool of 20 lineups will be much more concentrated uh, than what you actually have in your entire pool of 500, right? So, I mean, we can look at this, even the DeMarcus Cousins, right? We had 100% exposure in our pool of 20 to DeMarcus Cousins. In our pool of 500, we only have 30% exposure to Cousins. So there are certainly, there's actually, uh, just in this pool of 500 lineups alone, 353 lineups that don't include Cousins that we think are still viable lineups for the contest. Someone like uh, Markinen or, or John Collins, maybe there's a little bit less flexibility of, of fading uh, both of those guys. And as you start to stack up more and more extreme exposure changes, right, you're going to eventually butt up against this, the message that says there's not enough lineups that can support this, right? And at that point, let's just make it pop up here so we can see it, right? At this point, we have exceeded the pool of viable lineups for this particular contest, right? And I, I like to use this as a bit of a flag that at least you should at least check yourself at this point and say, okay, at this point, maybe I'm going a little bit too far. Not to say that there's not viable lineups or not profitable lineups outside of this pool of 500. Of course there are. 
And not to say that every single lineup in this pool of 500 is, these are not literally the top 500 positive EV lineups that you could have possibly built, right? I would love if it were, it's not that. Um, but this is a good point to say, okay, at this point, I might be making too many changes. This might be the point where I'm, I'm adjusting exposures too much. But even on a slate where it seems like Saberson is screaming to you that a play is a must play, they may not be in the way that your very first 20 lineups makes it appear. Um, so I think it can be interesting. This is part of the reason why I like to run test builds and view the entire pool, but also research builds just to get an idea of what the slate looks like as a whole. Um, and I would in general feel pretty confident making adjustments to your exposures, provided that you're staying within the pool here, um, pretty freely. So, and again, that's not to say that, you, that there's anything wrong with exceeding the pool or that there's anything wrong with saying, you know what, I can't get 20 lineups out of the pool of 500 that fit what I want to do with this slate. So I'm going to go back to step one and adjust projections so that I do. Right, the model's not perfect. It doesn't necessarily pick up on everything um, all the time, so that that's fine. But specifically for this question, is there is there too much adjusting exposures? Um, I I would argue probably not. Um, so, but I mean, there there are obviously slate specific considerations here. There are diversification specific considerations. Um, if your approach to adjusting exposures looked something like this right well okay can't meet that one right this would be a little bit too risky for me personally to play i i i probably wouldn't at least on this particular slate would probably not take this approach um this particular approach to exposures of setting everybody to 30 max or something like that right might be too diversified for me but that's not to say that there's never, that's not to say that those are wrong or that you shouldn't use a core players or uh, diversify if that matches your, your personal risk tolerance. But anyway, I think in over, overall, and, and I'll wrap this one up and we'll move on in general, um, the adjustments that you make in step three, I think, especially if you've limited your adjustments you've made in steps one or, or even step two, uh, is where you can really feel pretty free to make changes and feel pretty safe. Right. One of the things I always like to say is that the, the more the more confident you are in your stand, I think the more comfortable you can feel making adjustments to support that stand in step one or step two before the build, because then it impacts all of the lineups here. Right. When you're making adjustments in step three, uh, even if you're you know relying a little bit on gut gut calls or some intuition there, right? All we're doing is we're selecting the best 20 we can out of a pool of lineups that we already think are viable given the the state of the slate, the condition of the slate. So if you say that, you know what? Um, I, I don't like the idea of playing somebody or I've got a gut call that, um, I want to get somebody into my lineups. I think you could feel pretty confident doing that in, in step three. So. Um, cool. Uh, I'm going to move on to this question. This came in, uh, from Devin in Slack here before the start of the the stream here he said thoughts on using satellite settings for extremely top heavy contests like the millie maker or even the 100k to first then huge fall off on second and down i think that's i think that's pretty sharp i think that's a good idea um looking a little bit giving like paying attention at least to the payout structures of your contest i think is a good idea knowing what it takes to create positive expected value lineups um, in those particular contests, I think is a good idea. I mean, if you'll notice one of the things that the settings on step two doesn't take into account here is payout structure. So if you're playing a million milli maker or something like that, a contest where you have a million of the first and then 10% of that hundred K to second, and then it just drops off like a cliff. Um, I think using the satellite settings to get a little bit more aggressive can be a pretty good idea. You'll see what the effect that that's going to have is it's going to crank up your ownership fade. It's going to crank up your sim variance a little bit more. Um, I think in general, our GPP settings are, are kind of optimized for contests that not to say that they are necessarily the flattest contests that you can find, but definitely flatter contests than things like Millie makers. And I think last night, FanDuel's big NFL GPP, their like main, their main 150 max GPP was 50 K to first and 10 K to second. That's another pretty significant fall off, right? Um, I think cranking up those sliders a little bit can help you get 
differentiated and get you a little bit higher variance in the contests where you need them. Contests like the mini max and things like that um, are going to have pretty flatter, much more flatter payout structures. And I don't think you need to worry about this as much. Um, another thing that I think can be interesting, especially if you're interested in, or if percentiles are a part of your process in general, um, I, I think experimenting with higher percentile values on step three uh, as a way to squeeze out the highest raw upside lineups possible in contests where you are really only rewarded over the long term for having that big top 1% outcome like a Millie Maker or something like that is a good idea. Um, be wary of those contests in general, though, right? It's just an incredibly hard contest to win, even if you have an edge, right? It can take a lifetime of slates to realize your edge that you might have in in a Millie Maker. But uh, I, do think it's, I do think it's the right idea. Um, and I think looking at the contest looking at the payout structures of your contests um, to understand where your expected value is, is, is a good idea. So um, let's see. So Ryan has a question here uh, about contest selection. Oh, actually let's, well, I'll answer this first. And then I saw I missed another question from Devin. So um, we'll do this one first. He said, I can't play the main slate tonight thinking about doing the Sacramento and LA showdown. Could you go about how you would approach selecting contests for this specific game? Yeah, let's let's take a look. These uh these showdowns, um, apart from well, the featured showdown on any given night, right? Especially on DraftKings, um, sometimes we'll have some pretty decent contests in it. Outside of some of the featured contests, it can get pretty rough. Um, so let's see what is what's out there. Um showdown. So it is the featured contest. Um, so I always like to see, you know, are there any contests that fit our metrics for, for contest selection principles. And uh, doesn't look like there's necessarily any here. So the single entries are always going to grade out pretty well, right? Like this $5 single entry has 1,900 effective entrance, right? That's going to play pretty soft. Um, I don't mind the and one here in the quarter jukebox. That's um, about, what, uh, 900 effective entrance here and about 700 effective entrance here, right? Both of these contests are going to have good payout structures and things like that too. I think these are going to play a little bit softer. When you get outside of the main slates, um, especially outside of, of football in particular, uh, you're going to have to make some sacrifices here. Um, playing the big $15 fadeaway, 150 max, 11K entrance would not be my first look, um, nor would be the $3 sharpshooter, right? This is going to play very sharp, 20 max with 3,000 entrance, uh, 5,000 5, entrance, 150 max here. Um, not great, but I, I do like this $5 single entry. I like both of the and one and the quarter jukebox. Um, that's probably where I would go first, right? So, um, and then the other thing too, to remember is that, you know, especially if you're playing contests where we can't always get the best contests available, the softest contests available based on our contest selection principles, uh, you can match that a little bit by scaling back the bankroll. Right? So if you're playing 5% of your bankroll on the average night in the main slate and getting it all into the best contest possible, everything grades out great, then fine. Uh, if you're sacrificing some some softness or some uh, you're playing tougher contests because you're, you're playing the showdown tonight, scale back the bankroll a little bit, right? You can match you can match that additional or that theoretical lower ROI or lower edge you have in those contests uh, by scaling back and maybe you play 1% or 2% of your bankroll instead. Um, I am curious too what FanDuel has got for this particular... Uh, contest. I like FanDuel's NBA Showdown uh, format quite a bit. I don't like their NFL format, but uh, with with NBA, since they have three unique multiplier spots, I think they open up a lot of ways to differentiate. Um, I think they allow people ways, a lot more ways to make mistakes, but the contests are a little bit smaller. So you kind of have a little bit of a trade-off there just because it's a, a smaller site. But um, I think... Let's see. Not a lot out there for this particular game. I mean, obviously, the single entries always look pretty good. Um, I think this... Yeah, this is going to be pretty top-heavy and pretty sharp. Um, so... Yeah. I, I like those ones on DraftKings, so... But... All right, cool. Uh, let's see. Let's go and, and jump back to this question from Devin here. Um, I won't be able to dive super deep into this question, but I'll kind of at least explain a little bit of what I was thinking here. Um, so Devin said a while back, you mentioned something about sorting your lineups in Excel or using Excel to help you pick lineups. Can you touch on that? I can't remember exactly what we were talking about here. And first of all, I definitely want to preface this by saying, by no means is this a must have kind of thing, right? This is definitely, I think, more of an advanced thing of something that once you've totally got the Saberson process down, if you want to add 
maybe something to your, your process here to incorporate some like external tools, uh, maybe something you've built in Excel. Uh, what I think I was referring to the last time this came up was a way of calculating maybe like ownership product um, or something like that, something that isn't displayed for you here in the app by as a way of calculating how likely a lineup is to be duplicated, right? Um, I, I, I've experimented a little bit with this in the past. I've like built a very basic spreadsheet that takes a full export of the lineups from SaberSim and, and calculates things like that. It calculated um, ownership product, first of all, but it also calculated uh, the, it well, recalculated the projected score just so I had it in the spreadsheet. And it also did, for a while, I was calculating like leverage scores on individual players. So I was getting a leverage score for an individual lineup, just something I experimented with. Um, I think it's interesting, especially if you want to, to try exploring adding a little bit of additional value to your process in the lineup selection standpoint. I think the one thing I would be cautious of is you are competing at that point directly with either Sabre score or projected score uh, as a metric of judging the quality of a lineup, right? I don't think projected score, the average projected score of a lineup is a very great way of determining the upside of a lineup, right? But it is pretty good. And we've put quite a bit of work into making the Sabre score calculation as accurate as possible. So anything you do in Excel to select for lineups outside of SaberSim after that process, um, you will just want to make sure that what you are doing uh, is is beating Sabre score, right? But um, I think it's at the very least can be kind of interesting or, or can be kind of fun. Um, so, but I, I, I think that's probably what I was going at um, the last time this came up, but, um, all right, cool. So let's keep it going here. Answer some more questions. These are the, all the questions that came in through Slack. So I'm going to hit these first, then we'll get to the questions that are coming in YouTube. Uh, this was from, uh, Goots, Gutsman, Gutsman. Not sure how to pronounce that one. Uh, so I watched the video about mitigating risk by making more lineups. What about satellite entries? You want to win as many as possible. Do you still want to employ the same method of spreading out or simply put your best lineup to try to win them all, knowing it is likely an all or nothing situation? But if you do hit uh, white check mark, um, yeah, it, it's it's tough when you're when you're talking about satellites, right? Um, I think it depends a little bit on you know how much volume you are playing in satellite entries and what you potentially stand to gain. If the lowest, if the lowest prize lineup hits, right? Like if you're playing fifty dollars of satellite tickets or something like that, and your biggest possible prize or your lowest possible prize there is a twelve dollar ticket or something like that, uh, I think there's a question of you know, does it really make sense to spread out and lower your variance to that extent in a situation where like you're you're potentially you you have a, a top 1% outcome and you don't even like make your money back, right? I'm more inclined when I play satellites, it's not something I do all the time. I'm more inclined to fill those using a ranked fill method um, and just understand that I'm playing a higher variance game. It's a satellite. There's one ticket, two tickets at the top, something like that. Um, and I'm willing to accept the additional variance of using a ranked fill method and playing the same set of lineups in all of the satellites uh, to maximize the ROI I have in those contests. Because a lot of times when I'm playing them, it is either to supplement or add on a little bit of ad additional action to that slate, or it's because the contest overlaid, and I think they're positive EV contests anyway. And at that point, I'm less concerned about mitigating risk, uh, spreading out variance, and I think I'm more interested in just maximizing ROI in, in those particular contests because I feel like there's, there's an edge. So, um, I mean, I, I think if you are playing, if you are playing satellites in such a way that Mitig maximizing your risk mitigation and lowering your variance as much as possible, then then maybe the satellites probably aren't the best contest for you, period. Um, I think in general, our recommendations for using a unique fill method and playing a unique lineup in every single contest uh, is for, I think, a situation where you're following a lot of our other contest selection principles, playing the best GPPs possible, um, playing up to 5% of your bankroll, in that case where it you definitely you have a little bit more at stake you have a little bit more to lose um potentially in those contests so i think i think for me personally i would i i would be more inclined to play for upside in satellites um 
and and just manage your bankroll and, and select for those contests in such a way that you're not if you're if you completely lose right you're not uh racking your bankroll or, or heartbroken at the end of the night or anything like that so um okay cool so uh sean said so based on the cousins example is it reasonable to say that if he's only appearing in 30 percent of the 500 lineups then in 70 percent of the 500 sims he's a complete fade he appears in the highest projected saber score lineups but in the bucket of all sims is less opt optimal so by by fading him you have a 70 percent chance of being right does that make sense um yeah so that what yes what is basically happening is you're we're saying so we're not looking at individual game simulations for this particular build, right? So this build was built at 057. So individual game sims happen at smart or sim sim variance 10. In this case, we built it at seven. So what's happening is we're taking a, a relatively smaller size bucket of game simulations, right? And then relative to what the players scored in that bucket of game sims and their ownership percentage, we're building the best possible lineup around it. And what, what essentially SaberSim is saying here is that when we did this 500 times that DeMarcus Cousins is used based on what he scored in that set of game sims and his ownership in 29% of them. But asking SaberSim what the highest expected value lineups are in the pool determined by Saber score, 100% of them include DeMarcus Cousins in the lineup. So it's kind of an interesting question here. Um, I, I, what, what Saber Sim is, so the idea of by fading him, you have a 70% chance of being right is maybe theoretically true. Um, the problem though, I guess, is that this, this pool of 500 lineups we have here is not necessarily the range of full outcomes of what can happen on a slate. It's just the first 500 optimal lineups that we've built here. And Saber Sim is also saying that. While 70% of the time DeMarcus Cousins doesn't appear in that optimal lineup, the top 20 lineups by expected value or by Sabre score do include that particular player. So this question has come in before in a different way of like people running research builds at 0, 0, 0010, right? And seeing that DeMarcus Cousins, for example, is going to be 25% owned, but only shows up in the optimal lineup 15% of the time, and then running a test build and seeing that they're getting 100% to Marcus Cousins and trying to determine, well, is this guy a fade or should I play him, right? I think that's that that becomes a pretty difficult question to answer, uh, and it depends a little bit on, on the context of the slate. I think it depends a little bit on the sport. It probably depends on the contest that you're, you're playing, right? So it's, it's kind of a tough... I think everything you've said here is is correct, right? 70% of these 500 lineups here, this player does not show up, right? Taking the, the points that the player scored in that particular set of sims relative to their ownership, it didn't make sense according to Saber Sim to use the player in that lineup. But the top 20 overall in the pool are, in theory, the highest expected value lineup. So I think there's a, there's a legitimate kind of decision to be made there. Um, I talk often here on stream about how I think one of the best ways, kind of like a little bit of a Pareto principle, 80-20 rule thing, right? I think one of the best ways to use Saber Sim is to figure out those key players that the slate kind of revolves around rather than trying to figure out what the optimal exposure is or the, or the right projection change to make on every single player on the slate. Figuring out what those big players are that the slate really revolves around that are crucial to the slate and then determining how you want to approach those individual players, I think is a really good approach. I think based on just what we're seeing here after running a couple test builds and talking through it on stream, I would say DeMarcus Cousins is absolutely one of those players tonight, right? There are plenty of optimal lineups you can make that don't feature Cousins. Cousins is showing up in the top 20 and probably a significant number of the top 50 optimals, right? So where you stand on this particular player, I think is kind of a core pivot point on this particular slate, right? You might be interested in being 2x the field, right? Managing risk a little bit on him. I think there's an argument to be made that taking an underweight stance or fading him is viable. Uh, I think there's an argument to be made that, you know, it's a difficult situation to assess and you just don't want this player to kill you. So you're going to match the field on him. 
right? I think you could also come at it from the standpoint of looking at, okay, so we've got a center and util player that's low salary. That's probably going to be one of the chalkier players on the slate. And maybe what we do to counteract that or to kind of um, leverage that, I guess, is we look for a player that maybe is going to be lower owned as a payup option at a similar position and get a little bit of additional leverage there, right? Jokic is going to be popular, but maybe people find a hard, maybe people find it difficult to get to Christian Wood tonight, who's not projected all that well, but certainly has optimals where he's in the optimal lineup as a direct pivot off of the Cousins chalk, right? So I think situations where you're seeing that there are some discrepancies in in how how a player shows up in optimal lineups or how a player shows up in the top overall lineups uh, is a good way to come up with your potential list of what you think the, the players are that the slate kind of kind of revolves around. But there's not a one size fits all solution here by any means. So I wouldn't be able to tell you that, yeah, in this situation, you always fade cousins or in this situation, you always play him, right? There's, there's, this is definitely an interesting case on this particular player for, for this slate. So, and you can almost, another way of kind of thinking about this is you can kind of almost see just purely by the process of expanding the pool, right? You can kind of see how your lineups become diversified and how the stand on the player becomes less significant as you add more lineups to the pool, right? Like with 20 lineups, we are, oops, with 20 lineups, we are 4X the field in theory, and we are locking cousins in. And as we allow for more and more lineups showing up, right? Like our lineups diversify more and our stand on this particular player comes down. The other thing to know too here is that we've, we've only built 500 lineups. If you wanted to kind of explore this a little bit further with a bigger data set, uh, you could build 1500 um, and, and see what happens from there. So uh, Kevin said, I wanted to let you know that I've been using your bankroll management and contests and game selection. Love not redepositing every night, although I'll keep sneaking in one big tournament lineup. I'll learn one day. Yeah, that's great. Um, I, I think that is just a, crucial part of a DFS process. It is not exciting at all. I know it's not exciting. It's exciting to me. I always love contest selection and bankroll management strategy conversations, but uh, there's a reason it is the first two lessons in both our NFL and NBA course. The first video you watch, if you were to take this course uh, is about contest selection and, and it's important. Um, especially now, you know, rake, rake is as high as it basically has ever been in the, and the field gets sharper and sharper. So figuring out where the softest opportunities are to realize your edge is important. Um, definitely nothing wrong with throwing in the one lottery ticket, uh, uh, on a, on a nightly basis, or even every so often, um, I fall victim, victim to that. It, it is fun to have that, that little hope, that little sweat, um, on some of those big, big tickets. Um, especially if that, you know, a lot of times when I start, when I play that kind of stuff, I don't really think about it as much as like my bankroll management and contest selection strategy. Uh, that's, $15 or $20 that I'm completely happy never seeing again, just for, for the sweat of the, the like hundred K or whatever. Um, so nothing wrong with that, but, um, all right, cool. Let's see. Uh, I swear. Okay. Um, so there's a question from Jeffrey here. Miss this. Uh, what do you look for the most when adjusting options? Uh, do you look at projections, usage, minutes, etc.? So my personal approach, uh, I'm going to give you two different options here. Um, so my personal approach in general with most sports is to make the general assumption that the projections are mostly right, that they are ca they are already capturing whatever needs to be included from the standpoint of who's going to get minutes, who's going to play, who's going to get the usage when they're out on the floor. Um, and my, my personal approach is instead to try to play a game theory angle of finding where ownership is going to be inefficient or roster construction of particular players is going to be inefficient. Um, on NBA in particular, I, I don't even do a lot of that. I think the biggest edges in NBA are via contest selection and, and late swap. So in general, I, I often don't make a ton of changes to even my player exposures, um, in NBA hoping for you know, really news to break or uh, for one reason or another to, for ownership to just be inefficient on the best possible place. Um, in NFL, a higher variance sport or in baseball, I do take a much more um, kind of finer tooth comb to my player exposures and intentionally try to leverage the field on particular spots. Um, if you're interested in watching a video about how I go about doing that, 
some of my strategies I go to identifying those plays. Um, the last video in our NFL course is an hour long video of me doing a real NFL build where I kind of explain, here's how I research the slate. Here's how I find the plays that I think are going to be inefficiently owned. Uh, and here's what I do to take advantage of that. Um, I did the same thing. I know it's not baseball season, but I have a very similar process. If you want to see it for a different sport, I do a similar thing in this video in the baseball course, last video in the course. Um, Max Steinberg, one of our partners here and a uh, professional daily fantasy sports player uh, did a similar video to what I did, but for his MBA process. And that is the second to last video in our MBA course, how to beat daily fantasy basketball, like an NBA DFS pro. And uh, Max does have a very projection oriented approach where he goes in, looks at rotations, looks to find maybe situations where the field and maybe even saber Sim is improperly assessing who's going to play minutes, who's going to get usage when they're on the floor, makes a lot of adjustments to projections. Um, and he, this is a very detailed video about the tools and the research that he does to do that. But it is just my particular really flavor of DFS that I think it's a little bit, I don't know. It's just easier for the way that I think about DFS to generally make the assumption that the projections are mostly right or they are right enough or that that is not the best place for me to add value. And instead, my way to add value is to kind of try to, I guess, essentially exploit the field. Um, there are, oh man, I'm getting spam in my uh, chat again here. There are advantages to both, right? Um, I think... I think there are there are advantages or or, or disadvantages to to both approaches. Um, I mean, I think by studying projections and looking for situations where the projection models might just not be looking at a particular game environment correctly, you kind of naturally diversify, and you kind of naturally uh, what am I trying to say? You kind of naturally leverage the field by just doing something that is different, that is unique to you. Um, I think one of the disadvantages of what I do is that you are kind of counting on a somewhat rational field to be playing against, right? There are situations where I leverage against a particular spot because I think a player is going to be overowned, and then that player doesn't come in overowned, and then I've essentially leveraged against nothing and probably would have been better just playing a more just optimal strategy. Um, but I, I don't know. So different different strokes. In general, NBA is a pretty projectable sport. Um, it's it's fairly easy to to project for. So I think the the edge that you potentially gain in making adjustments there might be a little bit smaller. But that's just that's just my particular take. So uh, Jeffrey said, "Thanks for explaining that. I'll look at that video." Yeah, and if you have any questions about anything that I do, I, I've gotten plenty of questions about follow up questions from people that have watched these videos. So happy to talk about that, um, or any questions from Max's video as well. Happy to to shed some light on that as well. So. Um, okay, cool. I'm working my way backwards now, realizing I missed some questions that came in at the start of the stream. So Wes said, how do I prevent players from that who are out from popping up in lineups? Anytime I would X them out, they would pop back up in step three when building. Um, I would say, I mean, the most important thing is, is just double check and make sure that those players are actually listed as out, right? It does take a couple seconds to, for the Sims to run, right? If we got, if we got news right now that, um, Cole Anthony was going to be out for the magic tonight, right? It would take a bit of time for that sim to run and for everything to update there. So make sure that projections have updated and double check on step one, right? When a player is out, they should look like this, right? It's like name out, not included in the pool, zero projected. Like that's how you know they're out. Um, I know you are a run pure subscriber. So the other thing is if you're using the run pure projections or an average of the two, you need to make sure that both models have updated. Uh, the timestamp when you're on the, rub, the the run pure app will, if you hover it, it will say when the last time both projection models were updated. So just make sure both have, have updated, right? Um, and then the final thing is just make sure, you know, that you're actually running a new build. If you go into a build that already exists and you open it back up, and then you click this refresh, right? It is going to refresh for the most recent projections, but it's not necessarily, it's not going to rebuild any lineups. So it is possible that you could get a player that is out in your lineups if you just go in here and refresh. When big news breaks, or really just, I mean, especially for your final builds before lock, make sure that you're actually going in here, you're refreshing the projection, double check that the player who is out is showing as out, that everything is updated. And then if you run a new build, you shouldn't get that player in your lineups. Um, if you do certainly let us know because that, that would not be good. So 
But most commonly when I hear this from people saying, I'm still getting players that are out in my lineups, um, either the sim hasn't run yet, uh, or what they're doing is they're going into a build that already existed and refreshing their lineups instead of um, actually starting with a brand new build. So, um, Devin, I, I think maybe I'm missing a little bit of context. I think this is maybe half of a question here. Exposures to keep an eye on in step three for NBA to adjust like high exposed value plays. Um, I assume maybe this is like, what are some ways to know who to keep an eye on for NBA to adjust, right? Or or how to get an idea of of certain players to, to look at. Um, I think uh, there's a couple things. I, I think I've, we've gone back and forth about talking about the value of research builds in a sport like NBA um, where you don't necessarily need to look at single game simulations to approximate how likely a player is to be in the winning lineup. But I do think it can still be a good valuable tool here of running a build like this to get an idea of what, who are the players that have the greatest percent chance to be optimal on the slate? How does that number compare to their ownership projection? Um, I think when you're trying to decide what are the, what are the plays that I'm going to take a stand on or what are the plays that I think the slate kind of revolves around, like what we were talking about a minute ago with Sean, I think, you know, looking, look at the players that have the highest expected ownership projections because those are the players that you can either stand to get the most negative leverage on by fading or may require the most exposure to to get positive leverage on by including them in your lineups. Look at some of the plays that are the highest overall projected point per dollar plays, especially in a sport like NBA, right? Those are going to be the plays that are probably the most efficient plays to roster in your lineup. So those are the plays that you are probably going to get the most exposure to, right? Um, so I think running your research build, running your test build can be a good idea to figure out what the slate looks like, what those particular plays might be for you. They're not going to be the same for everybody. And your answer to how you are handling certain plays is not going to be the same as everybody else right? You may go through your process and maybe you determined like what we were talking about with Sean before is that uh, you wanted to go under on DeMarcus Cousins and somebody else runs a research build and determines that they want to lock him in, right? You could have a different answer, both play positive expected value lineups, but be complete, have a completely different approach on the same player on the slate. Um, I think in general, like one thing that I, one thing that I like to do, or at least I think is, is, uh, a good idea at looking at is in NBA, you are going to have players that are projected. Oh, it looks like cousins projection has already come down since we started, started the stream, right? You are going to have players that project for so well, right? At especially lower salary positions uh, that, you know, are essentially hitting value or are paying off their position in the lineup at even just their 50th percentile outcome. Where is the, where is my 50th percentile, by the way? Oh, it's mixed up, Right. Uh, that I think, I think it is easier to fade expensive chalk in NBA than it is to fade cheap chalk because the cheap chalk is often just so inefficiently priced in a low variance sport where players just have a very high percent chance of hitting their, their optimal theoretical target score. Um, I think you see minor projection inefficiencies at the higher end of the salary range where players with very similar ceilings, right? You will have one player become much higher owned. Let's see if there's a good example of this. It's, it's interesting tonight because John Collins is the fifth, fourth highest projected player on the slate and is actually very cheap. Um, tonight's an interesting slate for it. Let's look at, uh, let's look at last night and see if maybe I can come up with a good example. Okay, so I guess this is a decent example, right? You end up with situations where you have a player whose average projection, right, is much lower than other players at a similar salary range, someone like Westbrook, right? He's projected for four four fantasy points per dollar compared to somebody like uh, Lillard or Towns, who is 4.68 fantasy points per dollar, um, but have approximately similar top-end ceilings, right? I think when you're looking for fades or, or players to be a little bit more even with the field on or go under the field on, I'm always more inclined to do that with the stars, the high salary, the high projected players uh, than the 
the chalk or the cheap chalk, right? The cheap chalk is often really good. Um, I think people chase inefficient salaries at the average for the high, high projected players without realizing that a player with just a slightly worse average projection has approximately the same ceiling. Um, and you, you can get some interesting leverage on the field there. So, um, yeah, cool. Devin clarified what are some exposures. I think that's that's kind of I think that's the way I ended up answering that question. So let me know if there's any follow up there. But um, cool. Let's see. Let me go ahead and double check and make sure I didn't miss any questions here because I realized as I was kind of working my way backwards through the questions that had come in on stream here. Um, but I think that is. I think that is it. Does anybody else have any questions here for today's stream? We're right at about the 50 minute mark. So uh, another 10 minutes or so uh, left in the stream today, but um, can always cut it a little short if there's no other questions for me here today. We will, of course, be right back tomorrow for our last stream of the week, 2 p.m. Eastern. No stream on Friday for Christmas Eve, um, but we will be back here again tomorrow at at 2 p.m. Eastern for one more stream for this week. But let me see. Let me double check and make sure I also got the questions um, that came in through support. I know I got Six's question right at the start of the stream here today. But cool. Yeah, I think we're all set. I'm going to go ahead and leave it there. I won't uh, have you guys just stay here staring right at me. Um, Let's see. Well, I guess the last question here, uh, Chris said, what button do I press to win money? Uh, that is this button right here. That's the money printer button. So you go in here, you press this button. I guess actually then you also, you also have to press this button and then you win money. So easy as that. Nothing else to it. I don't even know why I come on here and stream for an hour every day if it, when we just have the money printer button. So anyway, uh, we'll go ahead and and leave it there. Um, that's obviously a joke uh, for 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 everybody watching here. Hopefully, don't end up sending the wrong message there. Um, but uh, okay, here's a good one. Um, Ky surprise. Is there a way to reset build settings? Uh, yeah. So uh, easiest thing to do. I know you might be playing around. Maybe you've tweaked these here. You've edited these, um, and then. Uh, what you'll notice is if you go back and start clicking these back in, they don't reset. Uh, just change them to any other setting, any change any of these, and then bring it back to what you were looking at before, and it will reset here. So um, pretty much everything else on the site also has kind of a, a big red reset button, right? If you've gone in and maybe you've like set a bunch of stacking rules and something or something like that, and you're like, oh, crap, how do I get rid of these? Uh, delete all rules. We'll let you get rid of that there. Um, if you've gone in and adjusted a bunch of exposures here, right? Maybe you've done like this, something, right? Uh, reset exposures button can reset everything here. Um, and then also on the, uh, main home screen here, you know, if you've gone in and made a bunch of adjustments here, and maybe you've edited some of these team totals too, right? Up here at the top reset projections can just go ahead. You can either reset just the games, just the players, or reset everything. So um, on the older version of the app, we did not have as many reset buttons, and it was uh, probably probably many of you remember this. It was quite a bit of a pain sometimes to go back and undo everything you may have done, um, but very pretty straightforward to, to reset everything now here, whether you're talking step one, step two, or step three. So Cool. Anything else? Any other questions for me here? Well, we have a little bit of of time. Give give it. We'll give it just a second here since we have the time. I'm sure I'm sure there's probably someone out there furiously typing trying to get their question in at the last second before I sign off. But it is a, a little bit strange not having football tonight here now. It's going to just going back to playing my like three different NBA sites is going to feel like a relaxing evening after managing football and NBA for showdowns and main slates and everything the last couple nights. But uh, it, was, it was fun while, while it lasted and we'll be right back to 
to the gridiron tomorrow. So I don't see any other questions coming in here. I see my, my viewer count slowly dropping here, which I think is my cue. So thanks again for everybody that tuned in today, asked questions, participated. Thank you, of course, to everybody that watches this show uh, after up on the recording, whether you're doing it uh, at home, relaxing after work or on your commute home. I know there's a lot of the commuter squad here that, that listens to this on the drive home. So uh, we'll be back again tomorrow, 2 p.m. Eastern, last show of the week. Uh, until then, good luck on tonight's NBA slate. I think that's like the only main slate going on tonight with NHL's paused, uh, no football. So uh, good luck tonight on, on NBA, and uh, we'll see you guys tomorrow. Take care.